Well, good morning, and thanks for being here today. This week, we kicked off a couple of holiday celebrations at the State House with the annual Christmas tree lighting. We'll follow that up with the menorah lighting next week. It's hard to believe it was only three years ago, during the height of the pandemic, that people weren't able to gather. Many businesses were closed, and things didn't feel all that bright and festive. We knew how hard this was going to be on families in particular. So to create a sense of hope and keep people connected, we launched Vermont Lights the Way and asked everyone to light up Vermont any way they could for the <coughs> holiday season. At the same time, we wanted to show Vermonters could also light the way with acts of kindness. So we also started Rays of Kindness, which recognizes people for spreading goodwill during an incredibly difficult time. The purpose was to shine some light during those dark times. And we weren't sure what to expect, but we got such a strong response. It was clear that this, this is something people needed more of, whether in a global pandemic or not. So we've done it every year since. And Vermont really does light the way in many different respects. And we've proven it time and time again whether it was through the pandemic, this summer's flooding, or global and national turmoil, Vermonters continue to show their commitment to community, willingness to serve, and going the extra mile to help those in need. We see this in all kinds of acts, big and small. Sometimes it's just the little things, those simple, random, everyday acts of kindness that can make all the difference in the world. And I believe it's important to highlight those deeds and the good people who make them happen. Over the last year, for example, a Colchester woman was recognized for lending a shoulder to cry on for a neighbor whose mom was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's and then visited her mom in the memory care center while her family was out of town. An eighth grader in Swanton helped families in need by providing care packages for their pets to lessen the burden on them and residents in Brattleboro organize a community toy drive. When it comes to the flood, there have been so many that have come our way, from EMS workers knocking on doors of those who needed heat, to state park employees evacuating and hosting campers in flooded campgrounds, to communities who donated everything from air mattresses to food for their neighbors. The point is, there's no act too big or too small to put forward as a nomination. And I know there are countless stories we haven't heard and that should be recognized. And we want to do that because kindness is contagious. There's a chain reaction with good deeds and we certainly need more good these days. I've signed a proclamation making December Rays of Kindness Month and we'll be celebrating these acts. So I'm asking Vermonters, if you have someone in mind, go to our website, governor.vermont.gov slash kindness to nominate them. And while we're talking about goodwill and helping others, please remember to buy Vermont Strong plates at dmv.vermont.gov slash vermontstrong23 to help the thousands of Vermonters still struggling from the flood. As a reminder, for the month of December, half the funds will go to help businesses who need a little help to get their doors open and keep them open. And the other half will go to Vermont Community Foundation for individual needs, specifically housing, critical financial expenses, food, and mental health. We need everyone to step up. It's not enough to pull out your plate from Irene. We need those who are struggling to know we have their back and haven't forgotten them. So with that, I'll open up the questions. Sorry to cut off the good vibes. The, the, good, the yeah. good news? Here I, I can always agree. count on you. <laughs> um, we are rapidly hurtling toward legislative session. What are maybe top three priorities for you heading into this year? Well, I would say, I mean, certainly um, top on the list 
uh, for me is something that's been top of our list the last six, seven, maybe even eight years, um, housing. Um, that's uh, certainly going to be front and center, and I think it's something that we share with the legislature. Um, the flood recovery continues uh, to be something we have to address and continue to do. Our flood recovery office will, uh, will continue to make sure that we channel as much funding as we receive from the federal government to do so. And then the budget, and it was just going to be difficult this year. Um, it's, it's going to be a challenging year. But, but I do think if we all come together with, you know, recognizing that we have some of the same goals, uh, that we can get through that and, uh, and make it happen and protect Vermonters while making sure that we're, we're not forcing people uh, to make decisions about where they live. So we want people to stay in Vermont. We want to attract more people to Vermont. And we certainly need them to fulfill our workforce. Um, but, uh, but we need all the ingredients to do that. When you say it's going to be a tough budget year, I've, I know that raising taxes is pretty much a non-starter and so are you thinking that there are going to be areas in state government that are going to have to see cut? Well, we'll see. I mean, obviously the legislature has all the power now. Um, they have the supermajority, and uh, I'll make my best, best case uh, for why we shouldn't be raising taxes, why we can't. Uh, we, they certainly uh, did a lot of that last year. Um, it took a lot of the, the taxing capacity away. And I, uh, and it doesn't leave much room at this point. And I think that many, there will be many legislators uh, on both sides of the aisle that will agree with that. So we're going to have to, to look for ways um, to, to move through. Uh, I've always personally and in my business and in the uh, political process and budgetary process, I think about things in, in terms of want and need. And, uh, the, uh, the need comes first. And it's difficult to distinguish between the two, but that's where I start. Governor, going off of that, last week's, week's education tax rate letter forecasted a pretty high property tax rate increase. Uh, so what do you say to the burden that could put on Vermonters? Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I don't think Vermonters uh, can endure. Um, and we have to uh, we have to find ways uh, to make sure that we're keeping the property tax. We already have one of the highest property tax rates uh, in the country, and uh, this is not going to be helpful in attracting more people to our state or keeping people here. So um, we'll have to work together and find ways uh, to alleviate that. And I think, you know, you have to be honest with ourselves, and every option, all ideas should be on the table without discounting anything. It just should be on the table and take the politics out of it. And uh, let's let's see what's best for the kids first. Make sure we're protecting them. And I would say that because we're spending, we spend a lot of money on education in Vermont. Um, but we have to we have to recognize we may not be getting our money's worth in terms of the outcome. Um, so we're going to have to look at that and address that. And uh, but keep in mind the goal of uh, making sure we educate our kids. A big part of that, that forecasted increase was because of COVID cash that districts were using, supposed to be for one-time funds, but now they've accrued those or they've, they've uh, built those those numbers into their budget. Now they can't support them. I mean, you and, and other lawmakers all along had called for use this one-time money for one-time expenses. I mean, did did the message not get through? What what apparently what are you not? Um, it, you know, I've as you recognize, I said this a lot over the last couple of years, we need to, all this money is one time, and we have to treat it as one time, um, meaning that we need to invest it in, in ways that would give us the highest return, and using it to just uh, take care of expenses, just spending it, will just lead us to where we're at today. So I think, uh, again, we're here, this is where we're at, um, there are local, local budgets that uh, that uh, have uh, a lot to do with where we're at. So we'll just have to address it and work together to work our way out of it. Yes, some of the educators would say, let's look at the factors behind these increases. Healthcare costs, sure. premiums skyrocketing. Yeah. Uh, also inflation. Inflation. Uh, so I mean, 
even though it's a huge increase, I think they probably feel like they're treading water. Yeah, well, 20% increase, uh, if, that, if that comes to be, um, is just not something that's palatable. We, we, just, we just can't afford it uh, without finding other ways to supplement that. What do we want to do without? And maybe those are discussions we have to have. But we have to live within our means because we're already spending a lot of money. How, how effective has Act 46 been in your, your mind? I mean, part of this as well is, you know, funding rural school districts as well, which cost more, of course, to educate rural st students. How, how effective do you think it's been since it passed five, six, I forget how long ago, but. Um, well, I, I, would, I would leave it to the experts to decide whether it's been effective or not. Um, again, I look at where we're at today, and some of the same challenges are there, and some of them are out of, you know, what we need is we need more people in the state. We need more taxpayers, not more taxes. We need, we need more kids to fill those schools, and uh, that's where we're, I think that's where we're missing it. And, and, and again, making it more expensive for people to live here and come here uh, is not the solution. Governor, a bit of a shift away from that, but Thank today, you. Vermont's, <laughs> Vermont's Criminal Justice Council is expected to make a decision regarding Sheriff John Grismore being able to continue practicing law enforcement in the state. Do you have any desired outcome from this? I mean, you've said before that you wished he didn't run for the position after the incident at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's a decision they're going to have to make. Um, but, um, and I made my, my point early on. Uh, I didn't think he should run, but he did run. And the people of, uh, of the county elected him. Um, so they knew with their eyes wide open what they were getting. So um, it's that now it's up to the uh, Criminal Justice uh, Board to determine whether he should continue to, uh, to be uh, certified in law enforcement. But that doesn't preclude him from being sheriff. And on another side as well, Montpelier's post office still remains closed. I mean, repairs have been going on there in the state house, different buildings across the city. Do you have any stance on potentially getting that post office back or a timeline for those offices? Yeah, we we have nothing to do with that. It's a federal uh, issue, and I don't know how much. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, and this is probably a better question for the federal delegation. But I don't know how much work they're doing to the to the building at this point. I don't know what their long-range plan is. Um, we reached out to them and offered to help in any way we could uh, with some of the buildings we have um, to to supplement or both either short-term, long-term uh, needs, and um, they weren't they weren't interested in, in uh, some of our solutions. But maybe they will be. We're still open uh, to having conversations about what that could be. What does it tell you about your communication or even the congressional delegation's communication with the Postal Service? I mean, they, they haven't even, the Postal Service hasn't responded to the delegation's letter of a month ago. Yeah. I don't know. There seem to be uh, autonomous to everyone else, and um, they don't seem to have to answer to anybody at this point. I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's a good question. Again, another good question for the federal de delegation, I believe, you how they the feel about it. the impression that they don't care? I don't, I, I don't know what to make of it, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, this isn't um, some small town that just lost a few post office boxes. This is our capital city. I mean, they should be paying attention to this, I believe. Um, but, um, but they don't appear to be. Speaking uh, of push about the pavilion, when do you expect to go back? I'd say in January, first part of January. And how has this been as a workspace for you guys? It's been great. Yeah. No, we're very fortunate to have it. It's the our uh, continual uh, continuation of operations plan uh, that we put forth. Uh, it was Suzanne Young that forced us to do it as Secretary of Administration, uh, and uh, and it was flawless in some respects. So. This has been great space for us. Seems to be better than the pavilion in the sense. I, you know, there's a lot of narrow. there's a lot of attributes to this. Wide. Yeah, no, I I enjoy actually being here. So, can you walk to work? 
<laughs> I could. <laughs> uh, how, how much less, in a way, is the cash flow now that all the COVID has gone away? Well, now we have, you know, another round. All the COVID money is gone, but then now we have more cash coming in because of the um, the IRA and, and the BIL and all the other federal programs that have come to be more infrastructure-wise. But that'll be uh, circulating within the coffers, and and that's one of the, the bright spots for us as well. That um, with the legislature, uh, we did come to agreement on having match money for that for that uh, those federal dollars and that's going to benefit us tremendously in the future as we try and ride this storm out over the next few years. Has there been any received drop now that Leahy's out there? Um, too early to tell but I'm sure there will be, yes. I have a question about uh, the state's high-tech operation. Every now and then I keep reading articles that, that, that way, way behind. The Vermont is? Yes, in tech. And, that, and just, the, I mean, last week there was an article about mental health for youth and the database was not working properly and that kind of stuff. Well, we, seems to be an ongoing yeah. problem for 10 or 15 years. Yeah, well, I, I would say the either DMV, uh, Department of Labor, all those legacy projects, the big ones, uh, have been on the radar for decades. And, uh, and now we're just getting to them. So again, um, the good news is uh, we are uh, in the initial phases of that, uh, DMV and labor, so, so that's good. Uh, when I came into office, we recognized the need for having an agency, a new agency uh, that uh, the legislature went, went along with us on uh, to create the Agency of Digital Services, which has been tremendously helpful in, in making sure that we have our thumb on those technical digital needs. So it's been uh, very effective I and mean, one of the highlights of, uh, of this administration. And you are the largest business in the state, aren't you? Possibly sure, probably. Employees and revenue and all that? Well, yeah, it's hard to look at it in terms of revenue, but uh, I don't think of ourselves as a business, but we do employ a lot of people. We should run it more like a business, maybe. <laughs> I was wondering how you sort of view the Republican presidential race at this point, understanding how you feel about Donald Trump. Um, would it be helpful to, to winnow this field down so there's one strong challenger to Trump? I think there will be eventually. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe a point is maybe not soon enough. Um, but, uh, but I think they're getting there. Uh, it seems as though it, it's coming down to, it seems to me as though it would come down to maybe DeSantis and uh, Haley and Christie, maybe. Christie would be on the outside. I mean, you've talked before about how important you feel it is that a governor be president right. uh, with that experience. So you've got Haley, DeSantis, and, and Christie. Uh, who do you like there? Who's your favorite there? Well, I, I like um, I like Chris Christie for a lot of reasons, but I like Nikki Haley as well. I, I know both of them, and uh, when I first became governor, uh, both counseled with me, so I know them better than the others. What do you like about her? I think her approach. Um, she is. Uh, she's got a lot of compassion, um, but she. She's run a state, so she understands, you know, how to balance a budget and how to make sure that economic development is on the forefront. But I can say that about Chris Christie as well. They're both, both the same. Do you look at her as a more realistic candidate in, in winning? It's it's hard to say, but I I think she she has a lot of attributes, and she certainly um, was on the the worldwide stage as well as the uh, ambassador to the United Nations, I think that's helpful, especially in these days. Have any of them asked for your endorsement? No, I, I don't think they want to hurt their chances. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, uh, your um, DCF commissioner sent a letter to lawmakers uh, asking them to 
once again, not just pause, but indefinitely pause the Raise the Age initi initiative. Um, what's, what's your assessment of, of how those reforms are going and, and why, why pause? Or, well, we've or, had concerns about the Raise the Age from the very beginning. So um, we decided to move forward with that. Uh, but, um, but again, we've asked for delays all along the way, and I think it's appropriate not to move forward with that. I think it would be more helpful. I think we have to, to rethink some of what we've done over the last two or three years and, uh, and maybe bring back the pendulum towards the center. Public safety is a big, big concern of mine and uh, many others across Vermont. For you, what's, what's giving you pause? What's changed? Oh, just the, the amount of criminal activity we're seeing across the state, across the country, but across the state in particular. We thought we were some, somehow insulated from all of that. But a lot of it is uh, due to drug, drug trafficking. And, and that seems to be the, I would say, the, the core of, of our issue. We can go to the phones. Uh, we have Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Governor, to go back to your topic, this housing. Um, when the pandemic started, the moratorium placed on um, the Christmas. And when I looked at the start, the, do you want the crack on the eviction design or what is that how compared to the square house? I only got about half of every word you said, Ed. So I'm, I hate to ask you this, but can you try it again? Unless somebody else caught it in here. Yeah, so putting some back feet, back feet there. I'm asking about the moratorium on eviction, which it was left. In the meat, um, there was a backlog that was built up, and I'm saying the staff so those backlog cases are, and how they compare to the, the, the historic average. I think you were asking about the moratorium on evictions, um, and I'm, I'm not yeah. sure of the status of that at this point, and, and how long that will will be in place, but I'll, I'll get you the answer and get back to you. Okay. The second question related, when the eviction, when the eviction sorry, the pandemic started, Congress allocated roughly $50 billion for housing. The Vermont share went to Vermont State Housing Authority in which the land collects the information to be able to qualify tenant to get a rent update. A year later, Congress appropriated this program, but they went through a federal program where the tenant had to do the paperwork. There's a lot of landlords that didn't get paid because the tenant wouldn't operate. And I'd like to know how those landlords can get their back rent because some of them that I'm familiar with are not renting their apartments that should be available to the public. Yeah, I, I don't know as I got the, the full breadth of your question, Ed, unfortunately, but had to do with evictions again. I, you know, you're going back to the pandemic. I don't believe, I think. I believe that's all been lifted with the state of emergency. That That is no longer in place. But in terms of uh, if there are units that are not being utilized at this point uh, due to some legal procedure, we we definitely would be all ears because we we have a shortage of housing, as you know, and we want to make sure that we're, we're filling all those units. We need more online. We have the VHIP program that uh, was um, was something that I had thought about early in 
when I became governor uh, because I looked at all the homes in Barrie, for instance, all the beautiful Victorian homes and thought we should be utilizing them and, and maybe putting accessory dwellings on them, turning some into apartments and so forth. And we, should, we the state, should be, be putting that forward. The, unfortunately, the legislature didn't go along with that when I first proposed it. Uh, but now it's it's working. It's working well. They did adopt it, and um, and it's putting units back online for a fraction of uh, the cost of new ones. So, if you have apartment house owners uh, that uh, need some help in putting those back online, please uh, please let us know. And because we want the VHIP program, sounds like it would be most useful to them and to us. But I can, if you can, Ed, if you can. Send us an email with your questions specifically so that we get exactly what you want from that. Perfect. That would be so thank you. Thank you. I see the Jason. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca will reach out to you. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, Betsy Bishop, the president of Vermont Chamber, announced that she is stepping down next year after serving for many years. I was wondering if you had uh, a comment about that. You know, I, I, that was news to me as well. I had didn't, um, I didn't, hadn't heard anything about that uh, before I, I read it yesterday. Uh, unfortunate for the chamber. She's been, she's been great. Uh, 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 a great addition uh, to the economic future of Vermont. Uh, she has all the creds uh, that she worked with the administration during the Douglas administration. Um, she was deputy chief of staff, I believe, at that point. She was uh, Department of Labor. Um, so she uh, she understands government. I, I don't know what's next for her. Maybe you could tell me, but I but I don't know. I haven't I haven't spoken to her, but I, I owe her a call. Well, it, it does beg the question, Governor, because um, many people have suggested she should run for the job you currently have, and you two are friends, I think it's fair to say. Um, so, you know, being a reporter, we try and connect the dots. Uh, have you made a decision on whether you're going to seek re re-election? I have not. I have not. <laughs> Okay, that's a pretty brief answer there. <laughs> Trying to connect the dots here with uh, Betsy Bishop in here, but all right, thank you, Governor. I appreciate it. Uh, back to the room. Will you tell us when you do decide? I will. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned flood recovery uh, as one of the priorities for the session. Are you anticipating perhaps a package of one-time money to fill in gaps for? communities, residents? We're, we're still hoping. Um, we don't, I, I still don't know as we um, understand how much money is available uh, through the federal government at this point in time. So um, we're hopeful uh, that there'll be one-time money for mitigation uh, and, uh, and recovery. So we're still, uh, Doug Farnham's, uh, of course, our chief recovery officer and and he's looking for every pot of money he can possibly find uh, to help in that regard. So, um, and, we're, and you know, bigger projects like the the corridor from Barry to to Waterbury uh, is something that I'm I'm interested in. I think that could alleviate a lot of problems for Barry, Montpelier, and Waterbury in the future if we could expand the river corridor, provide capacity for storage of stormwater. Are you thinking of enlarging the river at that point? Well, it would be widening it, yes, um, and providing providing relief there so that the we can we can store the again the high intensity rainstorm that comes and uh, provide for a place for it to go. You think about I mean we're still making decisions about Central Garage, for instance, uh, whether we're going to rebuild there or we're going to vacate and maybe we would turn if we vacate maybe we would turn that into some storage capacity uh, there there are a number of areas along the river that i believe could be utilized um, and and use them for that 
for that storage bin, so to speak. I mean, there's a uh, proposal or an idea of maybe taking the state parking lots in downtown Montpelier and making those all green space. That that could work, uh, but um, but if they're low and they're parking, we just need the storage capacity. Um, so it doesn't. Again, I'm no expert, uh, but um, but we just need places for the water to, to naturally go and overflow the banks. And if they go on to a parking lot where you can move cars out of the way and not impact homes and, and businesses, that's great. You know, they, and then we can clean them up after. You mentioned not knowing at this point how much more money we're going to be able to get from the feds. What has communication been like with FEMA and the White House? And um, we have we've had a, a good uh, rapport with FEMA. Uh, the White House has been responsive, um, but um, and the congressional delegation has been there with us along the way. And we're hoping that there'll be some supplemental funding for some of those bigger projects, like the Barry project that I talked about before. Um, and and there is some money that is there uh, that that was appropriated uh, in the uh, supplemental bill. Um, quite a few months ago um, for FEMA and uh, and whether any of that money could be utilized for some of the mitigation work we want is just an unknown at this point but the delegation is working on that yeah because that was for the disaster relief fund and at least my understanding is that that's more for acute needs not as much these long-term mitigation projects but are you hoping for leeway in that? well there's always those notwithstanding clauses uh, that, that could be utilized With all of the flood recovery work that the state needs to budget for this year, I'm wondering if there are other policy priorities that you think are going to need to take a back seat. I'm thinking specifically of the legislature's appetite for a paid leave bill. Well, we have uh, the paid leave provision. We have the volunteer paid family leave that we put into place. It's working very, very well. And uh, it's an avenue that they should they should consider. I, I don't believe there's the taxing capacity that they see for that. I mean, there is always taxing capacity, but how much damage you do along the way is, is of concern of mine. So um, I think that that's one area that they should think about. I've already said that what we have is going to work, and it seems to be working for a lot of employers. How is it working? Like, can you kind of lay out? Because it's been, what, like a year since that? Yeah, um, I don't have all the facts and figures here, but but I can get that for you, or we can talk about it. That would be a good subject in another press conference, actually, okay. uh, to sh tell you where we're at with that. Okay, well, gave you a topic. Thank you, um, Governor. The the sheriffs are, had said that the last year's law was kind of a power grab by by the legislature, and are you concerned that a an appointed Criminal Justice Board decertifying an elected official uh, is maybe an, an administrative infringement on local uh, local elected rights. Yeah, it's right along the edge um, because they're not really barring him from being a sheriff. They're debarring that person from law enforcement ability. Right? You don't have to be. I don't believe, maybe I should check with our general counsel first, but I don't believe you have to have uh, a law enforcement certification to be sheriff. Sort of like sitting in the legislature without actually getting to vote. I mean, maybe that's not a great analogy, but to have a sheriff who can't be, who can't enforce the law himself as a police officer seems. Well, kind of although, I mean, you, you have. They're like an administrator, um, and they're there. I, 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 I agree. I mean, it'd, pr it'd be preferable if they had their okay. certification, but I'm not sure that that, that's where I, I'm not sure that it really is like unconstitutional because they're not throwing them out of office. That would be something the, the uh, legislature would have to do.
Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you.